This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Tim, one of the things, the consequences of the pandemic that's Maybe one of the more positive bits that's come out of the past couple of years is that women in the United States have made historic gains in terms of labor force participation in recent months. The participation rate for women aged 25 to 54 in particular hit 77.8% in June. That is an all-time record wow. since that data was uh, started to be collected back in the 1940s. But now all of that might be at risk because $24 billion in pandemic era government aid for daycare providers um, is set to run out at the end of September. That's bad news. Really bad news. I mean, it's such an important part of uh, keeping women in the workforce. And so for that, I want to bring in Reed Pickert. Um, she wrote this great story we have out uh, on Bloomberg.com in the Bloomberg Terminal right now. She's the U.S. economy reporter, and she joins us uh, from our Washington, D.C. bureau. Uh, Reed, first, tell me, why are daycares so on the edge and so dependent on this $24 billion worth of funding that's set to run out at the end of September? So if, first of all, thank you for having me on. But if we rewind the clocks back to the start of the pandemic, so when we saw daycares close, schools close, and suddenly parents, both mothers and fathers, were scrambling to try to figure out what to do with their kids, we saw this huge decline in workforce participation among women ages 25 to 54. Um, And what you saw as we moved on into 2021, we saw the American Rescue Plan really step in with this billion, you know, $24 billion set of you know, money for these childcare providers to help them keep their doors open. And childcare providers could use this money in a lot of different ways. So some of the main things that you saw, for instance, were, um, you know, keeping up with the rising costs as inflation, you know, pushed up the cost of a variety of different bills that these um, providers had. You saw in the case of paying their workers more or hiring more workers to open up more spots, um, just because, you know, a lot of lower paid sectors um, started seeing some pretty significant wages increases in the tight labor market. So child care providers had a really hard time hiring and retaining their workforce. And so that's kind of the ways that these these providers have used that money. And so fast forward to now, the Century Foundation estimates that, you know, more than 70,000 providers could be forced to close. Wow. Um, but, but, you know, I think even putting that number even more in perspective, closing is like, you know, the worst case scenario. So in order, before a child care provider closes, they're gonna try all different th- types of things to plug that go- that hole, whether that's raising tuition for parents that are already struggling to pay it, um, whether it's reducing hours, um, which, you know, is something that um, has already limited a lot of parents' ability to, you know, really participate in their jobs in the workforce and where flexible working has really stepped in, um, or have to have less staff, which means way less child care spots available um, for children across the United States. Reed, one thing that was so surprising to me as somebody who pays so much money every month in child care costs was how little child care providers get paid. There's, there's this value chain that occurs when a parent pays a child care provider and I don't know where that money is going because the people who work there are not getting paid much. What's happening here? So you're exactly right. Um, child care is a profession that most people are in it for the love of the job, not for the pay. Um, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics data, the average child care worker made $14.22 an hour last year, um, which for perspective, um, a lot of jobs, for instance, somewhere working at Target, for instance, the starting pay you know, may start at 15 to $24 an hour. Um, and so you can really see how these child care providers, it's difficult to you know, hire and keep these folks. Um, but it, a lot of this you know, goes into this idea of this broken system that we've heard um, people across the aisle talk about. And it really you know, is this system where parents are paying, really can't mm-hmm. pay anymore. Um, the providers are trying their best to pay their workers more. They want to pay their workers more, but they're paying a lot in terms of insurance and overhead and renting the space that we're, that they're in. Um, and then at the end of the day, you end up in this situation where kind of 
no one's quite happy. Um, and it's part of the reason that we've really seen more band-aid type efforts when it comes to the, you know, Congress's role in terms of providing funding, just because the inherent system doesn't quite work economically. Well, tell me about the change from before these uh, this money was initially doled out. Was this supposed to just kind of bring these child care providers through this tough period, or was it, you know, was it to allow them to get back on their feet, or was it, did it truly bring child care to people who weren't able to afford it for their families before, and was that the intention? So a mixture of all of these things. So I think the importance of talking about childcare is the pandemic shed a lot of light on how stressed this sector was, um, but it's been an, a, a challenging spot well before the pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, in the case of looking at what this money in particular did, um, it really helped address the immediate problems the economy was facing. The economy saw this soaring, soaring prices. And so from a childcare per perspective, um, that meant higher costs for rent, higher costs for utilities and electricity and groceries that they're providing the children at their at their daycare. It meant a tight labor market where it was even harder to offer someone um, such a low wage in comparison to all of these other sectors and ex expect them to stay. And so, you know, this was a, a measure that was meant to help in the short term, but the reality that we're living in economically hasn't changed a lot. Prices are still really high. The labor market is still quite strong. So, and yet this money that helped them get through there is, isn't there anymore. Yeah, so, sorry to interrupt there, Reed. But, but I mean, why don't politicians just look at this and say, wow, this is something we didn't know how much this money was going to do. Um, can't we, on a bipartisan basis, just fulfill this $24 billion uh, measure? Why are politicians why is this, I guess, even coming up? Why are we facing this child care cliff, as, as it's been called? Um, so, like a lot of things in Washington, it's it's not so simple. Um, this child care is an issue that is a bipartisan issue and one that's widely supported by Republicans and Democrats. Um, the way that folks feel that um, the sector should be supported differs based on who you ask. You know, one kind of promising thing that we've seen is we've seen a, a bipartisan child care caucus um, start to form with Representatives Ro Khanna and Nancy Mace, um, bringing more awareness to this child care cliff and this affordability challenge. Um, but you've also seen in terms of the appropriations bills that um, are now kind of getting caught up in the, the broader government shutdown mess. Um, there is an increase in funding for what's known as the Child Care and Development Block Grants, which is a program that's been in place for a while. Um, but the increase is, you know, nowhere close to the $24 billion that we saw in the American Rescue Plan, but certainly will help to some extent, but but is no way offsetting that. So Reed, just in the last minute that we have with you, based on your reporting, and I know it's not your job to make predictions, but I'm a parent who pays for childcare right now. Give me a prediction of what you think happens at the end of the month. So at the end of the month, um, nothing's going to immediately happen. This is a slow burning challenge that over the next six, 12 months is when we start to see these centers start to close. Um, but for parents, it means, you know, particularly mothers, it means things such as cutting hours, mm -hmm. switching to jobs that are less, um, less difficult, less productive, less time consuming, and therefore often pay less, or dropping out of the workforce entirely, which would be really sad at a moment where women have really been leading this recovery. I encourage everybody to check out this story. Threat of 70,000 daycare closures imperils U.S. workforce gains. Serious economic implications when we cannot take care of children in this country. Uh, the story by Reed Pickert and Kelsey Butler. Check it out on the Bloomberg Terminal, of course, also at Bloomberg.com. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Now, I've just recently returned from the Persian Gulf where I was a correspondent there for about three and a half years. And frankly, since the start of the pandemic, there is no part of the world probably that's flexed its financial muscle 
uh, like the Gulf. You know, bankers have been chasing sovereign wealth, cash. In Dubai, you know, you have a wave of Russians pouring in with their own assets, hedge funds, crypto firms. Um, but at the same time, you know, you look farther out across the Middle East and into Africa and the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have created sort of these devastating sustainability challenges for much, frankly, larger populations. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to have Noor Swade uh, with us. She's founder and managing partner at Global Ventures. Uh, and she makes investments in the Middle East and Africa. She's normally based in Dubai, but Noor's joining us now um, from London. Uh, so Noor, talk to me a little bit about some of the top investment themes for global ventures right now. So first of all, thank you so much for having me and, um, and taking the time. For us, as we see kind of our part of the world, we take a look, as you mentioned, all of Middle East and Africa. Uh, we are sector agnostic, so we invest across all sectors. What's really exciting to us right now are two key sectors at this point in time. The first is anything related to supply chain disruption. And the second is anything re related to food security or agritech. And our investment theses are always really thinking through five years from now, which industries are massively different to five years ago. So where are we at inflection points? What's interesting? Where can cutting edge technology impact hundreds of millions of lives in a very meaningful and financially rewarding way as well? So when we think about supply chain and what's happened over the last few years, we think about it all the way from material science, manufacturing, where we still import 90% of everything and we want to start importing less, through to logistics. So drone logistics on a commercial level versus using old trucks on rickety roads. So when we think about the whole value chain of supply chain, you know, our reckoning is if we're going to build manufacturing for this part of the world right now, if we're going to really disrupt supply chains, we're going to do them the way of 2023. We're not going to do them the way of the 90s. We're not going to build manufacturing mm. facilities that are old. It's going to be 3D printing, additive manufacturing. That's really one of the key areas right now is how do we come into our own when it comes to manufacturing and supply chains. Okay, so you talk manage manufacturing and supply chains, but you also said another area of interest for you is anything that has to do with food accessibility, food security. Um, talk to me about how you are able to, or working to grow food in the desert. I mean, I mean, what are the companies that you're investing in that allow for that? So there's a few, and you know, one of them is very exciting because it's really at that intersection of food and energy. So one of the companies, Red Sea, um, really has found a way to reduce energy consumption for the purpose of vertical farming by 95%. By the way, they desalinate water. And this is really at the crux of everything because the way, where we are, there isn't arable land. So you want to do vertical farming. Five years ago, vertical farming was something that was in proof of concept. We reckon five years from now, a lot of the food that's you know, being served in the region is going to be farmed in the region in these new innovative ways. And yet one of the biggest impediments to that was how much energy costs and how much energy consumption. Well, to explain that, because I don't think everyone knows what, what vertical farming is. It's the idea that you're, you know, you're stacking these crops on one another rather than laying them out on the ground. And they're in greenhouses oftentimes. And, you know, you need the lights and, 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 and water uh, in order for them to grow. Right. And that's what makes them energy intensive. And water is often the, the biggest energy consumer. So if you want to desalinate water, because a lot of these are hydroponics. So you need a lot of water and a lot of the water that gets desalinated uses a lot of energy. And that's often the biggest cost factor. So as we move from a world where you know vertical farms or indoor farming and the way you stack them in hydroponics is still in proof of concept and commercially unviable, and you want to take that so that that's actually how you produce most of the food, um, you really need to reduce energy consumption. And, and that's actually something that's across the region. So when we think about energy consumption, you have 760 million people in the world without power, of which 700 million are in Africa. So when we think about how we consume energy and how we go down, um, you know, building businesses that require less energy, not because we, you know, we care about the planet, which we obviously do, but because it's better business, because you cannot scale if you're consuming a huge amount of energy. And now that we've cracked some of these things, Red Sea Farms is exporting their technology and retrofitting farms in the U.S., retrofitting farms in Europe, because it's simply better tech. Yeah, but one of, I guess one of the challenges that you always face, um, especially for technology that would most benefit places like Africa, um, places outside the Gulf and the Middle East, is is that this, the the return is not necessarily there to put in a lot of uh, R and D to produce food um, from. Uh, from places that don't have a, a lot of water or to electrify places in Africa that have, you know, very um, low standards of life. I mean, can you talk to me about some of the ways 
that you are getting past some of these challenges? So I think that's where the opportunity sits. So for us, as we think about these technologies that are available globally, and there is R&D in our part of the world a little bit, not as much as we'd like, but a little bit, there's that opportunity to leapfrog. So when we think about vertical farming, if we had wanted to do that the traditional way or the way that it was done even just 10 years ago in North America or in Europe, that consumed a lot of energy, a lot of water, which wasn't available. So we had to leapfrog and think, how can we do this better? And the irony is that these are two scientists, one British and one American, that were sitting in Saudi Arabia in the desert and discovered that the way that the cactus plant desalinates water is much more energy efficient and emulated that. Hmm. But the concept of leapfrogging is something that's really important. So we don't have incumbents in our industries because the industries are still nascent. When you think about something like financial inclusion, you know, just five years ago, 85% of the people in the region were not financially included. Now that's down to 55%. And we didn't get there by building banks. We got there with cutting edge fintech. When we think about healthcare, we have one doctor per thousand people in MENA compared to four per thousand in North America or Europe and 0.2 per thousand in sub-Saharan Africa. We're never gonna have enough hospitals. We're never gonna have enough doctors. The question becomes, how do you use technology to give healthcare access? And therefore you have the adoption of tech in a much faster way, especially given 60% of the population is under the age of 30. Mm. Mm. So your digital adoption is instant, immediate. There are no incumbents or lobbies from the healthcare industry or the finance industry trying to stop these tech companies and the regulators actually want these solutions. Right. So you end up in a world. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I just we only have a couple minutes left and I want to make sure we get to the fundraising aspect of this um, because, you know, we talk a lot about uh, venture capital funding drying up over the last couple of years. And I'm wondering from your perspective uh, as the uh, founder and managing partner at Global Ventures, how much of your time is, is spent fundraising uh, and how hard has it been to raise money for funds? So we are on our third fund now, which we have um, managed to successfully raise most of this year. So we're very fortunate. I think our part of the world is still a great opportunity. Companies, because of the lack of the quantum of capital. So last year was our peak year in terms of venture funding at $3 billion for all of the MENA region, which is still a drop in the bucket of global venture. Um, so when you think about $3 billion, it's all deals all year um, across all the MENA countries. So it's a nascent ecosystem, it's fast growing, it's a very young population, and it's an emerging and growing economy. So most of our investors are actually international investors and institutions in the US and in Europe that want access to growth markets. And by coming in and looking at venture in the region, they find companies that are much more capital efficient because of the lack of capital in the ecosystem. We, a quarter of our portfolio is EBITDA positive, which for a Series A investor is highly unlikely in most other markets. And you're using technology to solve real world problems. So yeah. really the combination of that has enabled growth rather than shrinkage so far. Uh, look, I, I'm just quickly here because we only have about a minute left. But I mean, look, there's so much money coming out of the, the Gulf right now. Um, and you, you know, being based in Dubai, you see that, probably have access to that that others don't. I mean, what uh, priorities do you have uh, in funding projects or what priorities those investors have in funding projects that other investors you know elsewhere sitting in the united states or elsewhere don't so you know when we're funding projects we're looking purely at the technology our investors as i mentioned are 60 percent of our capital does not come from the region it comes from the us and europe hmm. and people are really looking for where there are growth areas in the world where we can use tech to impact hundreds of millions of lives to get the returns we're looking for um, our founders are globally competitive, and yet the market's so nascent and young and small that valuations make sense. Um, so I think that that applies to regional investors, to global investors. I think people are just looking for great entrepreneurs building meaningful companies in growing markets. Nor Suede is founder and managing partner at Global Ventures, joining us this afternoon from London, or I should say this evening from London. Nor, thanks so much for taking the time. Really do appreciate it. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, there's this great column from Bloomberg Opinion today. It's written by a professor at Fordham University. He's a theology professor, Michael Peppard. It's all about generative AI in the classroom. So when he first experimented with ChatGPT, he writes that he was not impressed. Um, but that was before he played with the GPT-4, which was released back in March. 
And he actually found the newest version of OpenAI's multimodal LLM, large language model, can now produce papers that are better than the average students. So that's just between different versions of ChatGPT. So it raises a lot of questions about the role that generative AI should play in the classroom. How should teachers use it? How should students use it? How worried should parents be that our kids are not going to learn how to do anything because of ChatGPT? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, Chris Callison-Birch has the answers. He spent years studying generative AI. He's Associate Professor of Computer Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Science. He's a Sloan Research Fellow, and he's gotten uh, faculty research awards from companies we talk about every day, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Roblox, and more. Uh, and gotten funding from DARPA, the NSF, and more as well. He joins us on Zoom from Philadelphia. Professor, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us. So a lot of parents are sending their kids back to school this week here in New York and other areas of the country. School started already. I know that one thing they're thinking about is how is my kid going to be using ChatGPT or generative AI in the classroom versus how should he or she be using it? What are your thoughts? Absolutely. So I was listening to a podcast this summer that speculated that there was a downturn in the use of GPT uh, as a result of its being summer break. And the reason for that is basically chat GPT is a homework machine. Uh, so we should see a corresponding rise again now that students are back in the classroom. Is that, a, I think is that, that okay, hold uh, on. That's, that's like, is that a concern though? Uh, the, for the for open AI or for us educators? <laughs> for educators, not for open AI. Uh, certainly, certainly. So when uh, uh, ChatGPT was released last November, it had this breakthrough moment where everyone suddenly became aware of it. And uh, at Penn, we had this giant meeting of all the faculty where it was on everyone's radar as a potential concern. And I think we're now just beginning to navigate what are good uses of generative AI versus not good uses of generative AI. And I think that those are going to vary depending on what level of education you're at, whether it's high school or below versus college use, and also sort of what level of mastery students have achieved already. I think there's like an interesting analogy with using calculators in the classroom where you want students to build fundamental skills first before you give them a technology that allows them to replace those fundamental skills. So are you going to allow your students to write essays with ChatGPT? I am in a computer science department, so we have fewer essays, but we have okay, a, okay, an well, analogous problem with okay. writing code. <laughs> Can um, ChatGPT write code? ChatGPT can write code. Over the summer, I was using it and basically pair programming with it, and it's magnificent. Like, I think this is going to be a tool that enters into all sorts of disciplines and that becomes an integral part of how everyone does their regular job. And so I want my students to be able to use this technology, and I want them to be able to enhance their own skill set with it, but I want to make sure that I'm navigating it correctly. So okay. in my mind, there's like a there's an easy distinction to make. So what we want to avoid is unthinking use, use of this technology. So if you simply ask GPT to write your high school essay or to uh, complete my programming assignment, and you do it in an unthinking manner, meaning you just submit its output, that's clearly a harmful use of this technology where the student doesn't learn anything, we're not furthering their educational goals, and the output is crucially likely to be wrong in many interesting ways. These models are not perfect. They often hallucinate. So if you're a student listening to right, Bloomberg right, right. Radio, you're probably <laughs> clever enough to make sure that you fact check everything that it generates. So what do you want to see your students produce? And forgive my ignorance of code here. What do you want to see mm -hmm. them produce using ChatGPT? So I think that the, the analogy that I draw is essentially like what kind of collaboration would I allow a pair of students to do? And so that kind of collaboration should be allowable between a student and the generative AI system. I wouldn't allow a student to copy directly the code from their friends uh, without understanding it and without uh, like thinking through and learning anything about how to do it. I allow students to discuss the problems and get, gain a better understanding, but not to directly copy anything. Hmm. And I think the same could hold for generative AI. So you should be allowed to understand a problem and uh, 
I, th I think that generative AI is really magnificent as a personalized tutor. So you could use it to explore a topic, uh, provide examples of something that you're learning in class. Well, and okay. maybe you could use it so for let's, tasks that you've already mastered. So we only have a couple minutes left and I'm a I'm certainly a concerned parent. My, my kids aren't old enough to be doing homework at this point. But I know that if I were in school, uh, you know, this is something that we'd all be looking for, for help with when it comes to homework. So to remove yourself from the college professor and, and put yourself in the position of, you know, a, an eighth grade teacher or something, how, how, do, how do kids uh, use this technology in a way that's actually productive and not just a crutch? Right. So uh, students shouldn't use this to complete their homework assignments for them. They shouldn't use it when it's expressly forbidden. But if you're an educator, I think there's lots of really amazing ways that you can integrate this into your classroom. There's lots of really great uses of generative AI for creati creati creative applications. You can use it to generate images to help illustrate things and really empower students to realize their creative visions in very exciting ways. My uh, nine-year-old and I are designing a movie together, generating images using Midjourney, creating voices using uh, Eleven Labs, and all sorts of things where we have this really spectacular creative project together. And I think that those could be transferred into the classroom as well. That's pretty cool. Talk, for, be, explain just in 30 seconds what Midjourney is and how you do something like that. It's like the chat GPT for images, right? That's right. So Midjourney is a generative AI that lets you input a prompt so you can say a uh, woodcut print of a cat playing a banjo and it'll render that for you. And it's really amazing. So I totally recommend that parents try it out with their kids. It's great for imagination games. Very cool stuff. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time this afternoon. Chris Callison Birch uh, is an associate professor of computer information and information science, I should say, at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Engineering and Applied Science. He joins us this afternoon on Zoom. You're Make, listening. Yeah, oh, making ahead, your someone. challenges so much, uh, making your challenges as a parent so much more it difficult. Does. I know. <laughs> I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive crazy. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funk to music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. Well, it's already that time of day. We're less than 18 minutes away from the close of U.S. equity trading here in New York. The Dow down. We just heard the numbers from Charlie, half a percentage point. The S&P down seven tenths of one percent at 44.63 and the Nasdaq down one point two percent. Let's drive to the close with Eric Friedman, a chief investment officer at U.S. Bank Asset Management, joining us on Zoom from Raleigh, North Carolina this afternoon. Eric, good to have you with us. How are you? I'm doing great, Tim. How are you today? We're doing pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, my co-anchor today, Simone, raised a question earlier with our own Molly Smith on the economics team. And she said, you know, you look at this, what we get from the anecdotal, uh, I call it anecdata from the Fed Beige book, you know, the, the survey that it does of uh, local areas around the country and, and businesses. And it seems like everything is great. Um, what's not so great? Yeah, I think there's a couple things that we have to think about. We've been using this analogy, Tim and Simone, of the Fed acting like that personal trainer sitting next to your treadmill and really keeping that ramp elevated. And so what I what I think you're seeing is that the runner is still doing doing well. It's still jogging and keeping up a, a very strong pace. The, the question is, how long can that pace continue? And we do think there will be more of an incremental slowing as opposed to a just a absolute stop by that proverbial runner. So uh, we'd expect the data to still be positive for the next couple of months. And there's lots of reasons for that. The labor market's in great shape. The overall wage growth remains strong. And, and so that gives, on top of the still accumulated stimulus savings, that gives a lot of fuel, if you will. I'll stop the analogy shortly, I'm getting tired even saying it. But that's mm -hmm. the sort of thing that we think will start to slow down as we get deeper into the, let's call it holiday season, and into the turn of 2024. What about the holiday season or the changing of the, the calendar um, pushes, puts this pressure on the consumer or the overall economy? Yeah, you know, I, I think, Simone, there's probably a, a level of, I'm going to call it conspicuous consumption, the desire just to keep accumulating stuff. I, I think there's, there's still this desire to go out and travel. There's still, you know, there's more talk about the replacement cycle, of course, four years ago. 
um, in a couple of months. That's when the, the COVID epidemic really forced so many people to, to be at home. And so the replacement cycle on goods starts to kick in, as well as just, again, making sure you're, you're taking care of your mother-in-law at, uh, at holiday season. Those are important things. So those are things that can drive spending. And, and the question, I think, for all of investors, including ourselves, is, well, what's, what's after that? Will there be enough accumulated savings and will the, the job market remain healthy? Uh, we do think, again, we have more of a glass half full forward perspective, but there are a couple of speed bumps along the way. Again, the back to school, uh, return to holiday shopping season, as well as just that cumulative impact of higher interest rates. Those should serve as that, again, proverbial, uh, um, uh, let's call it personal trainer, keeping the, the button up elevated for longer than anybody would like. Now that you mentioned it, I think I am due for a new iPhone this year. Mm. It's been it's been a few years. iPhone 15? I don't know. I don't even know what I have at this point. It still works pretty well. That's the thing. So maybe I'll go three years before I uh, do an upgrade. Uh, okay, so Eric, I know you can't talk specific equities, but let's talk sectors here. Um, what are you doing with capital right now? Yeah, one is that we're trimming some gains in technology, hmm. and and that's not to not to say that we think technology is is completely overbought. There's there's a lot of things that obviously comprise technology. We think that things like cyber, things like AI will remain in vogue, and so we'd just be again harvesting some gains there as opposed to just extending. Um, and again, our, our long term viewpoint is that you do want to have an outsized allocation to technology and probably healthcare. Those would be the two sectors that we favor uh, on, on more of a enduring basis. Uh, I think the other thing that's really picking up of interest, at least on our screens, is energy. And, and that's a space that does spit out some cash flow. They've generally been very capital disciplined as a group. They've been forced to be capital disciplined. Shareholders have said, look, you can't have this Pavlovian response of just when oil prices go up, you go out and try to find more. That has really been reined in. And so you're seeing global demand still hang in there. You're seeing a more disciplined operating environment for uh, E&P companies as well as R&M folks. And so that's the space we'd pay attention to. The last thing I'd say is Japan is looking more and more interesting. It obviously has had a good run already. There's all sorts of things happening within that economy that we think are attractive. So those would be a couple of areas that we'd have on your radar screens if they're not already. Yeah, on the energy front, I mean, we're looking at WTI right now at 87.65. Um, that's some of the highest we've been in a long time. I mean, but a lot of that is seems to be dependent on the Saudis, the Russians, um, rather than necessarily the oil companies themselves, at least the oil price. What, what do you look for when you look through the sector? Uh, what kind of companies stand out as, as winners versus losers? Yeah, there's a couple of things that we pay attention to. And you're right, Flea, you point out that the macro price of oil does not necessarily mean that that the oil companies, again, the whether it's the super majors or the exploration production or the refiners are necessarily going to do well. So a couple of things we pay attention to. Number one is, as I mentioned a second ago, that capital discipline. Are we seeing return of capital to shareholders? Are we seeing... Uh, just just blatant CapEx overruns. That has not been the case. We're very encouraged by that. Number two is, and it's a related point, and not to get too wonkish, but you know, return on invested capital. So once people are being more capital disciplined, are they finding ways to actually turn that capital discipline into higher earnings per share? And that's something that we actually have seen consistently, particularly across the super majors. And that's an area that, again, without the ability to talk about specific companies, that's a space that we think has been the most disciplined. These are the groups that will benefit from, again, not that we want the, the challenges in Russia uh, or Ukraine to, to necessarily be sources of profit, but one of the things we pay attention to is just what is the global response? And, and again, that response has been still a lack of supply relative to demand, which we think will carry on throughout the course of this year and potentially early next year. So we look at the super majors, that'd be a place we pay attention to. Also, some of those more disciplined exploration and, and production managers, those are also spots to uh, to pay attention to as well. I want to ask my uh, last question in a, in a nod to Carol, who's out on vacation, and she can't get angry with me for asking <laughs> you about the Fed. But how closely are you watching what the Fed does in September? And what do you think it's going to do in November? Yeah, I think Tim, it's the it's the, it's the primary focal point right now. You know, we're in that that shoulder month period where we're pretty much done with earnings, and September twenty first is is looming fast upon us. And as the great Rod Stewart said, you know, this is the time when I should be back at school. And again, we're all being 
forced to pay attention to uh, to what's happening with the Fed. So we think the bias is going to be a pause for this meeting, but also to keep optionality for the balance of the year. And so we do think that not just what's happening within core services, yeah. which mm. remains sticky. I mean, that, that remains a, a sticky area, but also some of these non-core things. Right. Again, like you mentioned, Simone, seeing the oil price elevate, that's a, that's an issue that the Fed's going to have to reckon with. All right, Eric Friedman, the Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Bank Asset Management, joining us this afternoon. Really appreciate you taking the time. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week on Bloomberg Radio. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.